we have the survivalist hard drive, don't we? Don't we? Uh, how, how much do you defer Great to the question. place you're at in lieu of your survival? The survivalist hard drive operates in the moment. I don't want to die now. It doesn't operate for 100 years from now or 200 years yes. from now. If I tell you I found an asteroid and it's going to take us out in 500 years, you say, let somebody else worry about it. So you're not thinking about the species. You're only thinking about your own, your own ass. And I don't know that that feels selfish. It feels in me. I, I don't know. It's, it seems you mean, woven it, into my DNA. Yeah, should, I should it, is it bad or is it just the reality of it? Yes. And, and I can tell you, my access to people's sentiments like that came through the fact that I received these letters from people. Mm -hmm. It's angst. Someone said, you know, I heard the world's going to end in 2012. And it's a kid. The adults are saying, you remember the whole 2012 scare, or even the 2000 scare, the Y2K. Mm -hmm. They're people who, who are afraid. They don't want to die. And so who do they turn to? And I'm an astrophysicist. I have some sense of the universe. And so I get these letters from them mm -hmm. asking about how the universe matters in their lives, particularly people who are in search of meaning. Mm -hmm. Maybe they didn't get it from whatever else they did in their walks of, in their arc of life. And so... This is an intensely interpersonal collection, just for that reason. Yes. The reason that you started saying here, what, what, how is this going to end? Where, what does it all mean? What are we doing? Yes. So They talk about not traveling the planet now. I've seen that come up lately, where people say we should cut down on our travel to preserve the flat planet. And I don't want to do a corollary on if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's there to hear it, does it exist? But if the planet is there and I can't ever go see it is is, is it, it really a planet to you? <laughs> well i'm just saying what, what is the definition of a planet yes yeah, so i think the the issue is not that we shouldn't travel is that we should find another way to travel that doesn't destroy the planet why why be defeatist about what it is you should or shouldn't do why not be inventive and innovative and in so doing you come up with solutions undreamt of by the previous generation thomas malthus who said who said population will outstrip food supply because population is growing exponentially and food is only growing arithmetically, so we'll all starve to death one day. And he had no idea that science would be brought to bear on animal and animal husbandry and plant crops. Yes. And so breakthroughs. They bre happen. <laughs> if, if things kept the way they were back in yes. 1780 or whenever he wrote, yeah, we'd all be dead now. Yeah. But we have innovations. We have creative people who say, I don't want to die, so let me figure this out. We now have more food grown on less land by fewer people than ever in the history of civilization. Mm -hmm. The fact that people are starving in the world is not because there's not enough food. It's a distribution political problem. It's not because we're running out of food. I want to talk to you about science being settled. I, I think oh. that was a bad... I, I don't know, Gore to me as a civilian, uh, I, I think that was a bad play saying science is settled. He's being broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. so, so what you say is there are things that science has discovered that are objectively true. Now move on to the next problem, okay? If you jump out this window, you will fall, and we know exactly the rate at which you will gain speed and likely what will happen to you when you hit the ground. Newton okay? was a suicide hotline Thank operator. You. <laughs> exactly. We had that soon. We got, we we got Newton. that. Newton's laws work. Okay? They don't all of a sudden stop working just because time moves on. So when you, in science, if you've done an experiment enough times, not just you, because you could be biased in your own laboratory, yes. but somebody else with using a different wall current, somebody who has a different belief system than you, if they, and they design a different set of uh, experiments to test the same idea, if you all get about the same yes. result, it's you, it you, you got something there. And if you got something there, that's what becomes the objective truth. This is why science is so valuable and so important to the progress of civilization. So yes, there are settled scientific ob objective truths. On the frontier, nothing is settled. You go to a science conference, we're duking it out, people screaming, hooting and hollering, and yeah, because everyone is passionate. You can't do anything that long with no rewards without passion. <laughs> Scientists, you know, it's they're paid well, but not crazy well. I mean, well, I love that contentiousness. I love brilliant men locking antlers. I'm a little more worried when I read the back and forth between Phil Jones and. And Michael Mann, those East Anglia memos. I, I, I know people, I bring that up and people chortle and they go, well, uh, you know, you're, you're over-interpreting those. These are things they didn't think were going to be seen. And quite frankly, they didn't resonate well when they talked about the 
climate, the temperature right. is so going down. And what two people say to each other is irrelevant. What matters is the peer-reviewed research results. And never is there 100% of all scientists who agree on anything. The good thing about science is that the player is irrelevant. What matters is the data. What matters is the consistency of results. So you look around and someone does an ice core through Greenland glaciers and they get some result about what the oxygen or CO2 was 100,000 years ago. Somebody does an ice core in Antarctica. They have nothing to do with each other except they're 12,000 miles apart. They're getting a similar answer. Oh my gosh. Oh, there's, there's, there's the migration patterns that are changing for insects, for flying insects. Oh my gosh, they're migrating earlier rather than later. And you put all this together, the, the botany, the biology, the geology, the, the atmospheric chemistry, the oceanic research, you put all that and all leaning in this direction right here. And if you're gonna lean this way, I hope you don't have power over legislation because that could be the beginning, the beginning of the end of our civilization. Um, I wanna talk about faith and science. Now mm -hmm. I- uh, As you yes. correctly noted, it's a big, it, uh, it drives a lot of people to send me letters. And yes. so there's a big, quite a sampling of those exchanges in here, not only from uh, Christian people of Christian faith, but Muslims, there's, Jew, there's a, Jew, a letter from a Jewish woman who's trying to raise her kid, but the kid is in denial of the Torah. Mm -hmm. And she, she's wondering what to do about that because she's sending him to Hebrew school, but it's not sticking. And he believes in science. And I, so there's a lot of angst yes. in the letters that I get through there. Um, I don't even know you're a man of science, I don't know your faith, but can the two coexist peaceably? Well, well, they do empirically. So, what, in the West, about 40% of PhD level trained scientists would claim a personal God as part of their belief system. Mm -hmm. What I mean by personal God is a God who listens to their prayers and they think about who is paying attention to them and their needs or wants or desires. So. And they can still publish productive science. So it's factually yes that they can coexist. But there's a caveat. If you're going to dip into your Bible or any religious text and declare that you found something about the Bible that applies to the natural world and scientific methods get a different result, if, if you're a betting man, <laughs> you're not going to bet on the scriptural interpretation, you're gonna go with the scientific result. The history of this exercise bears that out. So modern enlightened religious people are perfectly content saying, uh, my, my, my Bible, I use it for spiritual mm -hmm. fulfillment and enlightenment, not as a science textbook. And uh, Galileo is famous for saying, the Bible tells you how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. Hmm. Well, I, I think of Galileo in this back in the 1600s. Uh, he I guess he jumps on Copernicus's theory, theory yeah, yeah. of heliocentrism. The next thing you know, he ends up before a Catholic Inquisition <laughs> board. I'm wondering today, is some of the secular community turned into a latter-day uh, Inquisition Well, board? you can do that if what you're bringing forth does not have any evidence in support of it, and you want to make laws based on it. Think about what America is. America. We are, uh, I hate to overuse the term melting pot, but look at how diverse we are as a country mm -hmm. with fully practicing fundamentalist Christians, atheists, Muslims, Jews, animists, the, the political space, we're all here. If you have a belief system that's not anchored in objectively true things, and you rise to power, and you make a law that derives from your belief system, now that law has to apply to people that don't share your belief system. Mm -hmm. that, what's, what is that? Whereas an objective truth, I've said this before, the good thing about science is true whether or not you believe in it. Okay, and of course I mean objectively established scientific truth are true whether or not you believe it. So if you're gonna base laws on something, why don't you start there? Because that applies to everybody. I got one here, yeah. one of the letters. Someone and by said, the way, the book is Neil deGrasse Tyson, Letters from an Astrophysicist. And I know uh, I'm looking at it as like a strunk and white elements of style, common sense. It is a- Oh, that's nice. Uh, Thanks. I take that as a compliment. Yeah. Right. It's a well, very, I'm just saying, I think there's wisdom to be found. Tell me about the specific so, Yeah, so just one particular case. This is not, doesn't involve religion, but it, it involves a belief. Uh, someone wrote in and said very politely, uh, Dr. Tyson, do you think there could be a large hairy ape wandering the Pacific Northwest? Okay, so this is like code for, together now, Bigfoot, mm -hmm. all right? So I said, well, 
you know, we think we've discovered all the large mammals. Mm -hmm. we, we think we have. There's some animals down bottom of the ocean. We can just, we, because we're not, we don't hang out there. Occasionally one shows up, there's a new one. Mm -hmm. Most of the animals we're discovering are much smaller. Yes. And much less, and plus I said, if it's, if it's an ape of any kind, it's a m mammal and it reproduces sexually, so there's gotta be at least two of them. If there's two of them and they're still around, they got to be some babies. Yes. And and if they're babies, then you got to find poop somewhere. Yes. You don't need the animal. You just need evidence of the animal to to convince people. So I said I find it unlikely. And he writes back and says, "For a scientist, I thought you'd be open-minded, but you are so closed-minded." And so he got, then it turned out he was angry. Hmm. And I said, "Here's what you do: try to spend more time finding the thing and dragging it into town square." than trying to convince people that it exists in the absence of that evidence. Watch new episodes of Larry King Now, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, on demand on Aura TV and Hulu.